Angela Kern. Uh, I started a Facebook page to raise awareness about the spray out here. Uh, my question is, will 40 people be enough to give accurate results? And will a study that small be taken seriously? I can tell you that the study will be taken very seriously. Um, 40 is a, is a reasonable sample, especially if it's well, um, um, uh, that's the word I'm looking, distributed, thank you. <laughs> starting to run out of syllables. Um, yeah, especially if it's evenly distributed around the area and we are careful with our sample collection. So. And her dad has Parkinson's and we attribute to the spray. Um, one more question quickly. Did, to the best of your knowledge, are 2,4-D and atrazine only used in forestry applications? Or are they used in agriculture as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, two, two, uh, Dale Mitchell with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. There is 2,4-D and, and atrazine are materials that have a wide variety of uses and use sites. So they're used in production of, of agricultural commodities and and. Uh, are they also used in, in like roadside applications? Or are they used in home home? Like, they're for sale in every home and garden store, yeah. with the exception of down to earth. They are very common active <laughs> very ingredients common active in a multitude of products used in a lot of different site uses. Thank you. Hi there. So are there any chemicals that you'll be testing for in food and water um, that whose metabolites or who themselves could be mistaken for 2,4-D or atrazine metabolites in urine? Excellent question. Of course, my math risk is assessors and toxicologists. I, 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 well, our testing will include the, the parent compound. Our testing will include the, the parent compound, the, the pesticide itself, and, and also any of the metabolites that might be um, might biodegrade or degrade from the original pesticide. Well, you mentioned that in food, though, and water, you're going to be testing for a wider range of pesticides. I'm just wondering if any of those could change the data for you know how a person appears to be oh. exposed to. It, in other words, I'm trying to get confused by what we're seeing in your anyway. Yeah, because I'm trying to figure out is how are you guys going to determine if if, if nothing's found in food and water related to atrazine and 24 d how will you guys determine that it's that the intake is through air? And that's something that hasn't really been made clear. And there have been a lot of questions about that because most of us do kind of think it might be drip, especially so urine. Is that correct? So that's an important distinction. Okay. So maximum contaminant levels are for environmental are for water. Mm -hmm. um, how and uh, how we understand the concentration in, in urine is a very different process, and that they're not they're not you can't match them up very easily. And that I have just reached the edge of my toxicological knowledge. It. So, so, uh, right. So, in with urine, there's no, there, there isn't a, a standard concentration that we you know, like below this number. <coughs> safe or above it, it, it isn't. So what we use for what we use for thresholds for that is we compare, um, we just see how a person's urine concentrations compare with other people's urine concentrations. So um, the best study we have, we have for that is, is called the, was the National, National Health, Assessment, National Health Assessment, Environment. Assessment Nutrition <laughs> Exposure. And Haynes. I, I can never remember all the, the acronym, but it's a it's, it's a, a it's a national biomonitoring study. The C D the C D C does it and they so they they take people from all over the country, they measure uh, environmental chemicals in their blood, urine, serum, and then they what, what they do is they, they just report what it all is. They just report the numbers and so they determine what you know what's the fiftieth percentile, you know, what's the ninety fifth percentile for that concentration in people's urine across the country. So, so what we're proposing to use as a threshold is, is the 95th percentile for the and that general means U.S. population. The 95th so percentile means that means 95. Go ahead. 95 percent of the people sampled um, had concentrations below that number. Right? 
Okay, so uh, so we think that's pretty good. You know, you could go with the 50th, but to be protected, we want to go with the 95th. So so if if anyone's urine um, has a concentration of 2,4-D or atrazine or metabolites that are higher than the 95th percentile of the U.S. population, then that would count as above the threshold. But, so does that make sense? Yes, okay. that does. Thank you. Okay. And, then, and, we, and we do it that way because we don't really know like what concentration of urine correlates to what um, dose um, through water or food. So that's the best we can do right now. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I uh, should introduce myself as one of the four surviving members of my family uh, that didn't, hasn't had cancer. Five of my brother, sister, brother, uh, mother and father, five of them died of cancer. One of them survived still. I survived uh, polyp removal myself, so I, <coughs> I consider myself lucky. Uh, I want to explain something, a couple of things before I ask my question. One of them is how it is that a lot of people believe that it's, <coughs> excuse me, that it's safe to use these pesticides. And I can only do that by referring to a metaphor, which would be if you give a man a six gun with six bullets and you've got a stadium full of people, it's relatively safe for most of those people in that stadium. But if you give a thousand people a six gun, the odds increase hugely. There are thousands of these chemicals that are applied randomly and just willy-nilly in the forest and all over the agricultural lands of this country to the point where half of the male children born today will develop cancer in their lifetime. We know what's happening here. So my question, and oh, before I go on, I want to say one more thing. I can't be the only one here that reads USA Today. Roundup exposure in utero uh, results in a seven IQ point reduction in the average person who is exposed in utero. I'm not the only one who knows this, I hope. Roundup is really dangerous. It's exceedingly dangerous. It's just a lie that the manufacturers and the people who sell it want to put on us. So my question is now. Corporations make huge profits from buying, sell, from selling and applying, spraying everyone randomly at random high to low levels of environmental contamination to people in environmental environment. So how is this corporate profiting any different from intentional corporate genocide? That's my question. <laughs> Well, it could be rhetorical a, or moral or philosophical <laughs> or spiritual. It might take us all day to ask our question. Well, I, I, it might not be what you were intending, but I will offer my colleague uh, from the Department of Agriculture <laughs> and um, and uh, other folks who have regu EPA has regulatory authority over the manufacture and use of pesticides. If you want to take a stab at some part of, of the intent of that question, sure. Anyway, if you can discern the the full, well, I mean, the, the, the yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. No. And so I, I said at the beginning that when EPA reviews a new pesticide product, we have a standard. It's in the law. It says no unreasonable adverse effects to people, the environment, or not target species, something like that. The people that come to work for EPA, these scientists, they come. I work with EPA and I'm proud of it and I'm passionate about protecting public health and environment and that's the great majority of people that come to EPA have that mindset. So the people that are evaluating these, these chemicals and doing the risk assessments, they're doing it, they're good scientists, they're doing it with the best intentions in mind, they're not intentionally allowing chemicals to go into the environment that are going to harm people. Um, again, sometimes there's unintended consequences, there's things that we don't know when these chemicals are approved and that's the process that we're engaged in with you now. We're collecting data to see, you know, is something happening that we weren't aware of um, out there. I also mentioned the reevaluation process every 15 years for all of the chemicals. Uh, that can be short circuited. That can be shortened if new information comes in that's really compelling and, and we want to look at that. And that's happening with atrazine. That's not on the 15 year cycle. That's being looked at before that 15 year cycle is up because there's new information coming in about the effects. But why isn't it listened to then? Like, why don't they do in the 80s that it caused all these problems? Hang on, hang on. So, the same within 24 hours for children at no harm. 248 predates EPA. Yeah. And EPA has to buy up the existing stocks if it's. There are very few biocides that EPA has ever gotten rid of since 1970. Most of these poisons predate the creation of the EPA in 1970 
And EPA, there's a whole slew of whistleblowers who have had to lose their jobs to cry foul, and there's no way you can test the synergistic interaction of all these poisons connected together. It is physically impossible to do, and there's no discussion of the precautionary principle to avoid further exposure while you do your medical tests. I'm telling you, we do it with best intentions, with the best science available. Why don't you ban them? You know, I've been in the test site program. I'll ask you that question. I've been in the test program for seven years, and I was talking to a gentleman out here during the break. Just in the seven years I've been involved, I've seen a number of the more toxic chemicals uh, either been banned already or in the process of being banned. There's something called azophos methyl, which is an organophosphate. It's being phased out. It's a widely used and another test. another one comes back up on the market. No, not, not an organophosphate. Okay, you know, I mean, have a so. <laughs> Okay, there's carbofurion. Again, another very toxic uh, organophosphate. It's being phased out. It's being banned. Uh, there's examples of pesticides that aren't completely banned, but there's additional restrictions put on. So chlorpyrifos is an insecticide that used to be, you go in a hardware store and buy it. You can't do that anymore. That's, you know, not used, it not be used in a household setting anymore. You know, we can use an agricultural setting. So I, I, I've seen this. It, it is a slow process. I will grant you that. We are a bureaucracy. We have laws and regulations and procedures we have to follow. But look, we're trying to do the best we can, really. No one's intentionally really trying to poison people or allowing you know, corporations to run our agency. I mean, it's, it's like we're doing the best we can. And, and as we can get new information that's compelling and we can uh, act on that, then we do. And I, like I said, I've seen chemicals banned. I've seen uh, chemicals phased out. I've seen chemicals had you know, restrictions put on them. Uh, and it's all, a lot of it, it's all it's, it's dependent on the science that's out there giving us this information. Yeah. Sorry, that's, that's, like the answer, that's, that's the answer I can give you. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, Doc.